to talk about scientific method and the structure of scientific method today. And I'm going to start with uh, the theme of this conference, Proceeding Past the Paradigm. And this is the paragraph that we were sent when we were asked to, to speak here. And I just wanted to read it out. We were invited to explore the implications of structured thought patterns on contemporary science and society and demonstrate the extraordinary capacity of the human spirit to innovate and free itself creatively from the chains of paradigm. So I thought a lot about this, and, and one of the things that it made me think of was something that Leonard Cohen said, actually. And he said it in an interview that he gave uh, with Sheila Rogers on, on CBC a few years back, and it was reprinted in Brick Magazine a few years after that. And, and this is what he said, and he was talking about his creative process. And he said, I think my opinions are second rate, but when you submit yourself to a form, then something happens, and you're invited to dig deeper into the language. And if you're looking in the Spencerian stanza, for instance, you have to come up with many rhymes of the same sound. You're invited to explore realms that you usually don't get to in ordinary, easy thought. I've considered my thought stream extremely uninteresting, and it's only when I can discard it that I can find I can say something that I can get behind. So I found this eternally fascinating when I, when I heard him say this because it really got me thinking about how science works. But think about what he's saying. This is one of the great songwriters saying that he doesn't feel like he's a creative person. It's only when he subjects himself to a form that he can actually say things that, that he finds that are interesting. So the question I want to try to answer in the next few minutes is what is the rhyme scheme of science. So what I want to do is, is go through the scientific method and give you a very quick tour, sort of open up the hood, if you will, uh, and, and talk about the different parts of this structured thought pattern. Before I do that, I want to just give you a couple of examples of uh, some of the incredible ideas that have come from applying the structured thought pattern that is the scientific method. Okay, so Louis Pasteur and others uh, came up with an amazing idea, uh, which now is called the germ theory of disease, that little invisible things that we can't see uh, are what cause our food to go bad and make us sick. So, and, and the question that Pasteur and others were trying to answer was a simple question, but a really difficult question. Why do we get sick? Another question that was tackled by uh, by Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace was, how did life get here? Again, a very simple question, a very hard question. And it was only via the rigorous application of the stru structured thought pattern that we call the scientific method that they arrived at this transformative idea. One more example, about 60 years ago, um, Watson and Crick came up with the idea of the double helix, and this uh, precipitated an explosion of, of new scientific thought that was called the life of biology revolution. They were going after a very simple question. How is genetic information stored in cells? Okay, so science uh, is a structured thought pattern, and I'm gonna argue that it's really good at helping us enter hard, hard questions. So here's the, the scientific method, as you probably learned it in school, six easy steps, um, six easy payments of $24.99. <clears throat> I'm, I'm gonna go through these one by one and, and talk about what the scientific method requires of us and, and where it can lead us. So the first step is to observe. Of course, we observe thousands of times a day, and most of the time, we don't pay much attention to our observations. And that is because most of our observations are completely in line with what we expect the world to look like. Every now and again, however, uh, we make an observation that just doesn't quite line up with our paradigm, how we think things should work. <clears throat> and in those cases, we say to ourselves, huh, or at least we should. Um, 
oftentimes we just sweep them under the rug. But if you are a scientist, oftentimes you are inspired to go to the next step of this structured thought pattern, which is to ask a question. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the questions because I think they're really important. So a question, everyone knows what a question is. It's a request for information, right? And we have all kinds of different questions that we ask. We even have different words that signify the different kinds of questions that we ask. How many, what, which, when, who, where, why, and how. And what I'd like to do is focus in on why and how, because I think these are two very special, very powerful questions. So I want to talk about why first. And I want to illustrate this with, um, by, by telling you what it was like to live with my daughter Gemma. This is my daughter Gemma when she was three. And living with Gemma when she was three uh, was interesting because her favorite word uh, was no, actually. Her second favorite word was why. And this is sort of uh, a typical conversation with Gemma when she was three. Where's mommy? Oh, she's at the grocery store. Why? Because we need food. Why? Because we need to eat. Why? Because we need food for energy. Why? Well, because our cells, they need energy to do all sorts of things, like growing and dividing and making protein and pumping ions across membrane. And she would always ask why again. Okay. Um, and my point here is that why is an amazing question. You can always ask why again. And uh, look at what she got me to do. She got me to talk about things in great detail. She got me to use words that she had never heard before. And three-year-olds are all about absorbing new vocabulary, which they do at an astounding rate. But not just that. She got me to talk about how things work. She got me to talk about the mechanisms that underlie all of the things that, that are mysterious to her. So that's why. And this, that's a question that we as scientists ask a lot. Now, one thing that, that three-year-olds don't do is to ask how over and over again. But I would argue that you know, if they did, they would get to uh, equally interesting places. So here's just an example of how that might go. Where's mommy? She went to the grocery store. How? Oh, well, she took the car. How? Well, she used the gas pedal to go and the brake pedal to slow down and the steering wheel to turn. How? Well, she moved her limbs, which was con uh, contracted her muscles, and she's got a rigid skeleton. And <laughs> how? Well, there are these proteins in the back of her eyes. <laughs> so again, you know, asking this simple question only a few times gets you very, very deep into the, the heart of the matter. And again, you can always ask how again. Um, so I'm going to take a second to talk about questions that I would call Science-y questions. These are questions that, uh, they look like scientific questions, but I would argue that you don't really need science to answer them. Okay, so what is the metabolic rate of a mouse? That sounds very scientific. How many blue whales are there in the world? These are all examples from my field, biology. What happens if you transfer the nucleus from the egg of one species to another? These are all challenging questions. Um, notice they're not how and why questions. <clears throat> and they really have the sort of flavor of science, right? If you wanted to answer these questions, you might hire a scientist. And answering these questions requires technical know-how. It might require a tiny little stethoscope in the case of the first one. Um, um, but I would, I would argue that you don't need the formal structure of the scientific method to answer these science-y questions. So let me try to illustrate that a little more deeply. So here are a few questions that I would call science questions that really require science to answer. So why is the metabolic rate of a mouse 20 times higher than an elephant? It's a hard, hard question. How do whales contribute to nutrient mixing in the world's oceans? How does an A 
decay of the cell, prevent more than one sperm from fertilizing. All of these questions are hard questions, and, and the answers are presumably complicated answers. Okay, so those are questions. So let's move on to the next step of the, of the scientific method, which is to hypothesize. And the scientific method uh, helps us answer hard questions by giving us a way to enter hard questions. And the way that we enter hard questions is by hypothesizing. And somewhere in your brain, there is a phrase, an educated guess. And it is linked in your brain to the word hypothesis. I'm sure that you learned this in high school. And I think this is not a great definition of a hypothesis, because it suggests that scientists sort of go around asking trivial questions and then guessing what the answer might be. Right, what's the metabolic rate of a mouse? 0.5 milligrams of oxygen per meter per hour, you know, per gram per hour. That, that is not what science is about. It's not about guessing to, uh, answers to those kinds of questions. So hopefully we can delete that from your brain uh, and replace it with, with this, which is a, a testable statement about the natural world that can be used to build more complex inferences and explanations. Now, generating hypotheses is a difficult thing. And those of you who watched Elizabeth Gilbert's TED Talk during the break know that uh, the creative process is a slippery thing. And it turns out that generating hypotheses is actually a creative process. Most people don't realize that there's creativity involved in science, but generating hypotheses, they have to come from somewhere, and that's uh, the creative process. So once uh, hypotheses arrive, uh, then the scientific method tells us exactly what to do with them. But finding them is actually quite difficult. So once we have them, we have to evaluate them. And we evaluate hypotheses based on how good they are at making accurate predictions. Nothing else. Okay. So that's uh, one of the, the really important tenets of the scientific method, that we evaluate how good a hypothesis is based on the predictions it makes. So how do we come up with predictions? This is, I teach this uh, to my students, and one of the places they often stumble is they make predictions that are just what they think might happen. But what's most important is that the predictions flow from the hypothesis. It's the hypothesis that generates the predictions, not you. Okay, so generating predictions requires us to actually imagine. So we have to imagine how the world would look and behave if the hypothesis were true. So we need to try the hypothesis on for size, or to use another metaphor, to see the world through the lens of that hypothesis. Once we've done that successfully, then we can start to say, oh, okay, if this hypothesis is true, then these other things must be true. And we can generate a list of hypotheses, uh, sorry, of predictions. Sometimes you come up with more predictions than you know what to do with. And the scientific method is very clear about this. It tells us to find the prediction that if it were to be proven false would be most uh, devastating to your hypothesis and go after that one. Now this yeah. makes a lot of people uncomfortable because we like our hypotheses, we get attached to our hypotheses. And to attack our hypothesis so directly and so mercilessly makes us uncomfortable. And this is something that uh, no. science asks us to do that Not yet. you don't see a lot in other fields. But it really is the best way to proceed. Uh, it actually reminds me a little bit about, uh, of what Ian Spears was talking about when he brought up this phrase of creative destruction. Uh, so we go after the hypotheses, and the ones that are good hypotheses will survive. And those that aren't good at predicting will not. So the fifth step is to do an experiment or to collect some data to evaluate the predictions that you've zeroed in on. And this is a huge topic, and scientists spend most of their time actually doing experiments or planning experiments and trying to get funding for experiments. But basically, what you're 
you're doing is, is trying to test how good your predictions are. And this requires all sorts of things. It might require some sort of engineering skills to build something to make the measurement you want to make. Um, you have to think critically and, and imagine how others might uh, interpret your data that you collect. Once we have data, then we have to figure out what they mean. Um, and if you've done your job, then what they mean has everything to do with all the stuff we've done before. Okay, so basically all you're trying to decide is how good was the prediction that you tested. Once you know that, then you can evaluate how good your hypothesis was. And once you evaluate your hypothesis, then hopefully you now have an insight into your question. Okay, so that's the rhyme scheme of science. Uh, it is an intricate form, to be sure. Um, and it requires lots of us uh, to observe when we be sensitive to our environment. To question, we need curiosity and humility to admit that we don't know everything. To hypothesize, we need creativity. To predict, we need imagination. To experiment, we need all kinds of things. Ingenuity, critical thinking, precision. And to analyze and conclude, we need logic, which stitches the whole thing together, hopefully. There are lots of ways that this can go wrong, or you can get stuck when you're doing this. Um, sometimes you don't make the observations you should make. You don't ask the questions that you should be asking. You ask the easy questions instead of the hard questions. Sometimes you you go after your hypothesis, which is such a beautiful hypothesis, and you destroy it, and then you can't think up a new hypothesis, which is terrible. Sometimes your predictions don't actually flow from your hypothesis. That's very common. Sometimes you get stuck at the experiment stage because you don't know how to answer something. You don't know how to measure something. So there's lots of ways this can go wrong. But if you stick with it, uh, and you get through this very intricate form, uh, the scientific method can help you enter questions that are hard, hard questions and lead you creatively uh, to ideas that you couldn't have gotten to uh, with, as Cohen would say, ordinary, easy thought. <laughs>